So hello everyone. Today we are going to talk more about uh, digital wallets and key management. So we are going to uh, learn more about what is the role of a digital wallet, what are the main operations and requirements of a digital wallet, and what are the approaches to key management, what are their differences and what are their uh, advantages and disadvantages. First of all, let's, uh, as usual, let's start with the definition of a digital wallet, and we define digital wallet as uh, something which is used to store keys uh, with the help of which coins are managed on the user's balance. And it is important not to um, confuse uh, wallets with banking systems or digital payment providers, even though it may seem from the standpoint of the user that uh, they are interacting with the same uh, with uh, the same with a certain app or something like that. The client facing a thin, uh, but underlying uh, what is going under the hood uh, is completely different because, as you already see uh, from the definition, the wallets are. Um, operating with the keys and uh, what you have for your banking or digital payment provider app is uh, just a front end and uh, this front end does nothing related to cryptography except for maybe uh, well, not maybe but uh, always it uh, does the authentication process so that you can uh, prove that well you can get access to your bank account and not to someone else's but the process and the mechanisms that are that go into these two types of um, of uh, software is completely different and the main functions of the wallet is key storage and again there can be different approaches for that and key management which includes um, generating uh, the keys using the keys and uh, as appropriately disposing the keys. So if something does not do these two functions, uh, does not do key storage and key management, it is not a wallet. It can be a payment app, it can be some front-end uh, front application, it can be anything, but it cannot be called a wallet if it does not satisfy these two uh, requirements with these two functions. First of all, what modules do we have in a digital wallet? The first module is key generation and storage, and uh, this is this is pretty self-explanatory. Um, depending on whatever system you are operating with, be it Bitcoin or Ethereum or Monero or Bitcoin Cash, whatever, the wallet will follow the protocol and create the key, generate keys uh, according to the rules of the protocol. For example, uh, depending on the uh, uh, depend, dependent on the digital signature mechanism, uh, uh, the wallet will be uh, using different types of keys and different key generation mechanisms that would satisfy the requirements of the protocol so that your signatures will be valid from terms of the protocol. It will not make too much sense to have a wallet which generates a signature which does not correspond to the rule of the pro to the rules of the protocol. And the storage module, of course, once the keys are generated, it's generally um, convenient and generally makes sense to store them. And again, we will talk about storage later, but just to keep in mind that this is one of the modules which uh, does these two tasks. The second module is uh, current status synchronization module. Uh, this is more of a networking module. For example, your wallet can act as a, a thin client, which means that it communicates with nodes on the network and completely relies on the node. Uh, relies on these nodes in order to provide um, an accurate and, and complete uh, information about the blockchain. Or this can be a full node which syncs with the blockchain state, so you always have the local copy of the blockchain and you are relying on your own local state of the blockchain. Wallet can connect to several nodes and uh, it needs at least one well-behaved node in order to um, have information which is again 
uh, true to life and which reflects the actual state of the blockchain and not what threat actor is trying to um, convince you in. Wallet can connect to random or uh, user-defined nodes and the, both of these approaches are okay and they make sense, uh, but sometimes uh, some wallet developers uh, hard code the list of nodes with which the wallet communicates. And this is not very good because uh, you, first, you are stealing the choice from the user, which is never, never, ever good. And the second is uh, these nodes are known to everyone to be the nodes of the that support actually all of the wallets that uh, all of the wallets of these developers. So uh, it will be more interesting for a threat actor to attack these nodes, to gain control on this node uh, over these nodes, and to use them in order to spread uh, malicious information or disinformation for the users of this wallet, and it can have. Uh, catastrophic consequences, as you may guess, based on what we have uh, discussed previously. The next module is module for processing in uh, existing transactions, and this is again um, quite self-explanatory. Self-explanatory. What it does is uh, validation and uh, making sure that uh, at least your transactions are valid and you are receiving valid transactions so that uh, the, the, the transactions that are concerning to you are valid. And uh, of course, you do not need to do everything. This can be just uh, verify signatures, for example, or uh, validate the structure or something like that. It doesn't have to be the full validation module as it is done in the um, Bitcoin node software, for example. And the next uh, module is generating and sending transactions. And again, pretty straightforward. Uh, since you want to send some transactions to the network, you need to have a way to generate them. Uh, making transactions from scratch and then encoding them or uh, serializing them, depending on the system, the steps may differ. But doing that manually would make absolutely zero sense uh, for because it would uh well it would slow down the adoption and no one would actually do that and that's why uh, well and of course you're not doing that on paper or in your uh, text editor because it would be just deranged to do so and that's why uh wallets allow you uh, provide you with the way to generate uh, transactions appropriately according to the rules of the protocol and Again, use your keys uh, that are generated and stored in the first module to apply a valid digital signature for this transaction that you are sending into the network. And with these four modules, we are going to look deeper at the uh, ways how can we store and process secret keys. So the first option is called uh, cold storage. Uh, usually it means recording on paper or some external media. The core idea of cold storage is that keys are not under the control of the device that has internet connection. Why so? Because uh, any device which is connected to the internet is exposed to many different vulnerabilities and prone to network attacks and viruses. So, um, for example, keeping your keys on your computer means that you need to have a strong firewall. You need to have uh, some way to make sure that there are no virus viruses already on your computer. Uh, you need to do the monitoring constantly. You need to make sure that your, um, I don't know, colleague Bob from your department doesn't come, open your computer, enter your password, which is your, uh, I don't know, birth date, for example, and steals your keys and so on and so on. The um, uh, the number of possible attack vectors uh, really increases on an internet connected device. And that's why cold storage can be a viable option for certain cases. But of course, uh, well, we will talk about the question of security and convenience a bit later, but 
uh, cold storage is it is what it is. The next way is warm storage. Uh, this is a device that handles the keys on its own, but turns on and connects to other devices only manually and only at the time of need. So here we see the kind of um, the in the middle of these two approaches. It's not completely cold, so always disconnected. Uh, and it's not completely hot, so it's not always connected. It uh, can connect to the internet, but only when you need that, for example, to send a transaction or something like that, or receive transactions to sync up your current balance in the system, for example. And hot storage, which means a device that is turned on most of the time and is connected to other devices. And most Bitcoin wallets, uh, where uh, by that we mean software wallets, are hot wallets. This is the convenience at the sake of security because, uh, of course, it's probably the, uh, the, the biggest rule of a thumb for uh, digital security is that people are choosing convenience over security. That's why we have uh, this very simple passwords that are easy to guess that's why we have people reusing the same password all over and over and that's why we have so many people who are using hot wallets uh, hot software wallets instead of warm and cold wallets because it's always there it's already on your computer which you use anyway you can send transaction at any time it syncs with the network all of the time so you always have the latest balance and well it's it's simply convenient right you don't really care about the security you believe that your device whatever the device you're using is secure just enough for for the keys to not be stolen and for the for uh, your coins to be safe but there is uh, of course convenience is one thing but there is also a different thing which is the e-commerce and for e-commerce having a hot wallet um, during their office hours is extremely important i would even go as far as to say that it is uh, vital for them because they need to uh, send and uh, update the status of their accounts uh, as, fa as fast as possible. For example, uh, if uh, we are selling something with Bitcoins or even if we have a cafe, we need to get the information as soon as possible. We need to process transactions all of the time because people are coming to our cafe. They are, they are paying for the coffee. They wait this 10 minutes and we need to wait 10 minutes. We don't want to, uh, I don't know, take a USB drive, plug it in the, um, the computer and uh, do the update of the account to see whether we have received the payment from the customer every time like uh, every time a new customer comes we do all of this process it would just be nonsense and that's why uh, e-commerce and like both physical and e-commerce uh, need to rely on what storage for processing transactions now moving on to a basic approaches um, to wallet key management and uh, let's first briefly uh, go through all of them and let and then uh, look at each one more closely so the first one is keys are stored and processed on a remote server basically you have zero control over your keys and you may not even know that these keys exist the service may e even simply lie to you uh, second is keys are stored on a remote server but are processed by the user and this is a kind of interesting approach which, which tries to be a silver lining uh, in combining both the convenience and the security of key storage. The third option is keys are stored and processed in the user's application uh, and basically this is this is what it is. So you are uh, managing and using your, the keys yourself, not relying on anyone, but only on yourself. So, uh, of course, uh, with bigger, um, with this comes uh, more responsibilities because uh, there is no backup unless you do the backup. There is no uh, cloud option to get your keys from the cloud and so on. And basically, these are three 
main approaches and there well there are only these three approaches to key management and the fourth the fourth uh, way is the combination of these approaches in uh, in certain way form which allows to uh, mitigate the inconvenience for example while still preserving the necessary or expected level of security and also these approaches can be used to increase the level of security without compromising the convenience or access to the coins. Uh, in order to do so, uh, you would use multi-signature with two or more keys that are stored differently in different places. For example, one is stored on a remote server but processed, uh, but processed by you, and another is stored and processed uh, on your device. Then your address will require uh, signatures that involves both the keys, for example, two out of three your keys or two out of two your keys. This is uh, this will require uh, multi using multi signature and give these uh, features of additional security and uh, even some convenience, maybe depending on how you do that. So now uh, going into more detail. So. The first, again, is processing and storing keys on a remote server. The way it works is service provides something in the form of a wallet um, we, where you have no uh, control over the keys. All of the keys are managed by the centralized storage and managed by this service. Again, the application that you have has no access to the keys. The keys are managed on the server. So you do not really own the coins. If we are looking at, uh, this, uh, at this definition strictly, it means that you do not own the coins because who owns the keys owns the coins. And in this case, it is the service which owns the coins. And what it means for you is that um, each user gets a virtual account for which the service locks or reserves a, a certain amount of digital currency. So, uh, but the real access to these coins is provided only by the keys owned by the service. So, uh, what happens in, in reality is that user has something which looks like a wallet, but it is not a wallet. And uh, of course, it means that the user has to trust the service provider completely. The actual Bitcoin transactions are managed by the server because um, the, the user simply has, I don't know, some fancy app which shows the balance and the list of transactions, which are pulled again from the centralized service. If the service wants to, it can spend the coins from the address associated with the users. For example, this is our uh, guy, Bob, and this is his address, right? This address is associated with um, Bob's virtual account with this obligation. And the way it works is that even if the service spends uh, coins from this address, it still keeps the obligation to the user. So for example, Bob has bought two Bitcoins um, via our service, which means that we better make sure that we have enough Bitcoins, total Bitcoins, so that Bob comes and wants to withdraw his two Bitcoins, he will be able to do so. And when he withdraws, it means that our obligation to Bob becomes zero. But as you may or may not have heard from the uh, last year's crypto scandals, especially the infamous FTX uh, crypto exchange, is that these services are not really secure because, uh, well, the owner of such a service can do whatever they want with your coins and these obligations, obligations that they have for you may mean absolutely nothing because 
is just a record in the database which can be changed which can be erased you can be banned you can be i don't know suspended or whatever they can take all of your money and reinvest it into their own pet firm where they do risky trading lose everything and you lose everything as well so this is not very good but there is um a very high convenience factor and even there is a factor which um even adds more to the convenience and this factor is um transferring coins between several users of the same centralized uh service for example if bob is the client of the service and alice is the client of the service bob can transfer the coins to alice and it will have zero fee because what is happening is that um, the service itself just rewrite the balances it doesn't need to make any physical transaction it just re rewrites the balances so bob minus one alice plus one and this is it it's instantaneous and it's zero fee because nothing is happening just database is being updated and this is kind of like um bank reconciliation works for example if i'm the client of uh, bank a and i want to send money to my friend who is also using bank a this is immediate zero fee and well basically perfect because um, there's nothing to be done but if i want to transfer money from uh, bank a to bank b it will mean that they need to do this reconciliation and the, the way it works for banks is that each bank keeps a certain deposit of money in a different bank and this acts as the service account which is again uh the balance is being added up or is being uh decreased by the appropriate numbers and they keep this um these obligations to each other and they keep obligations to the user and as you may already guess from where i'm uh, leading to is that this is the same and that's why we're always saying that the money you have on your bank account is not your real money it's just numbers that bank promises to provide you in form of a real money whenever you ask them to do so but it's not always the case and often it is absolutely not the case with uh, the um, cash limits and with the payment limits on bank cards and so on and so on so this is something to be mindful of and uh yeah this is more of a of the same thing and yeah moving on uh so next we have keys on the service uh on the server but only the client has access so the keys are stored on the service uh sorry on the server but key management is installed uh in the client application and the way it works is that the service does not have a direct access to users keys but it does the storage um what it means for the user is that uh, it's easy to access the account from multiple devices but still you are the one who does operations with the keys and who uh, actually uh, generates the digital signature and all of that uh, all of the key related operations are on your end and even generation of the key is done locally on the device of the user um it means that the user has control, direct control over the keys and direct control over the coins. Uh, however, he, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the user does not completely lose dependence on the service because you still uh, trust the server to uh, store your um, your keys. Okay, but uh, uh no 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 one thing to mention here as well is that if such service becomes unavailable then the user loses access to the coins unless they have a backup or until the service comes back online you cannot access the coins because uh, the service has no access to the coins they cannot get your uh, keys and neither do you so you well simply uh, either need to back them up yourself or pray that the servers are um the servers are 
have have good uptime and uh, the data will not be erased completely. So how does it work? Uh, in order to gain access to the keys, the user needs to complete a certain operation. For example, enter a one-time password, uh, provide a password, uh, or use the, um, uh, I don't know, confirm via SMS or even, I don't know, a phone call, whatever. Once this is done, the user receives the container, and the container is basically uh, the user's the user's keys in an encrypted form. So this, uh, simply the key is encrypted uh, by some master password uh, from which this key uh, is derived. So uh, in such a way, the user can obtain keys only when they need to, for example, send a transaction. And once this is complete, the user can purge the, the encrypted container from the device and forget about it and not care until the next time they need to send a transaction. And even if a threat actor manages to obtain the container, the probability of decrypting it is rather low because hash-based functions uh, are, are usually used to derive such encryption passwords. And as you know, hash functions are irreversible and brute force in hash functions would require just a huge amount of time. So the threat actor will gain nothing. So again, uh, just to reiterate, to make sure that uh, it's clear, user generates the pass, uh, the uh, keys for managing the coins. They are on the device. Then uh, the user has some uh, password-based key derivation function and the master password. The user enters the master password. Um, based on this master password, the um, the encryption key is derived from the password and this encryption key is uh, used to encrypt the keys uh, for the bitcoin for example for bitcoin or for whatever other system we are uh, doing this. so and these keys uh, for accounts become uh, encrypted in this container and then the encrypted container is put to the server only for storage no one can access it and no one can read the encrypted data uh, unless they are the user who knows the master password from which encryption key is derived. Then the user asks the service, he says, give me my container, give me my um, uh, encrypted keys, then enters the master password in the application locally. Uh, the master password derives, uh, the, 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 the encryption key is derived from the master password. The keys are decrypted and can be used to sign transactions. So this is basically in a very simple, straightforward manner uh, how it works. And user basically just needs to remember the identifier how to uh, get, so I want to get my keys, uh, my encrypted keys, not someone else's keys. That's why I need to remember my identifier and the master password to decrypt the container. And uh, these are the points. Uh, yeah, basically the same points. Now as for keys that are completely on the user's device. So uh, first, the advantage is that the user has full control over the coins and accordingly uh, more independent from external services. So they don't need to trust anyone to store or process the keys. Without the access to the network, the user can go into the wallet, create transaction and simply send it when uh, the network is back. So you don't need to have constant access to the network and you can even separate the devices. So you can um, transfer the transaction even without connecting to the network. So you create a transaction on one device and send it to the network from another device. Thus, you never actually expose your keys uh, to an internet connected device. But the main disadvantage is the need to store the keys always on the same device. The loss of the device or damage 
will mean the loss, uh, the loss of access to the keys and coins respectively. If the user has uh, the passwords encrypted, again with the master password, uh, if the user forgets the, this password, again, it will not be possible to gain them back. And that's why it is important to uh, do backups and it is important to either have the backup of the master key somewhere or have it completely, uh, basically perfectly stored in your memory so you will never for forget it. But uh, having and managing passwords, it is out of the scope of this, even of this course not speaking about this lecture. Another interesting way, as we have already mentioned, is storage of coins using multi-signature. So uh, how does it work? This can be either used for several people to spend mutual coins. For example, when we have a mutual fund and we want to buy some equipment for our company or, I don't know, new coffee machine for our cafe or whatever or it can be used for me as an individual, for any individual to spend their own coins. Here, it is important to note that differentiation of devices in terms of hardware operating system and the wallet software can provide enhanced security. So it will not make too much sense to have just, I don't know, three phones with the same software and the same wallet, because if the operating system or the wallet itself becomes compromised, it means that your phone will also be uh, will also may be may also be a victim of of this attack. But if you have different devices, each has different operating system and different hardware, different uh, even different wallet then it means that for example i don't know if my laptop gets hacked uh, it, the the keys that are stored on the laptop will be will not be enough to sign transactions on my behalf because the attacker will need to have either my smartwatch or my phone in order to send transactions or even if I throw my laptop away or break it I will still have the watch and the um, the smartphone so I can sign transactions even without this one so you you you, you get the idea uh, and yeah when using multi-signatures sending coins requires several signatures with different private keys, each of which can be stored and processed on a separate device independently of others. But of course, very important is to do this mindfully. For example, if you make a multi-signature three out of three, which means that all of all three of the devices have to be um, have to sign this transaction it means that losing one of the devices means you lose coins forever there is no way if you don't have backups if you don't have anything like that you are in a bad luck so be mindful with that and multi-signature also a security uh, thing to consider is that multi-signature only makes sense if each of the of the devices keeps one and only one key uh, it makes absolutely no sense to have two out of three multi-signature and keep two of the keys on the same device. It would just be, it would uh, destroy the whole purpose of, uh, of multi-signature because it's just, uh, well, it's just simulated multi-signature. It's not really uh, benefiting you in any form. So, yep, and also the same remarks in the form of bullet points. As we are moving to the end of this lecture, let's uh, reiterate on uh, gold, warm, and hot wallets from a bit of a different perspective. So uh, hot wallet is a digital wallet with private keys are stored and processed by a device that is constantly connected to the global network. Cold wallet is a digital wallet where private keys are stored and processed only on a device that does not have the ability to directly connect to the global network. And warm storage wallet is a digital wallet 
where private keys are stored only on a device that does not maintain a connection uh, uh, to the global network all the time, but only when the user needs to do so, for example, to send a transaction and update the status. And now uh, we have these three types uh, individual form. So here we have the hot wallet. It's always connected. It's always um, monitoring uh, the network. It's always online. Then we have uh, the warm wallet. It's manually connected, but it has these modules as well. And then we have the cold wallet. So all of these things are separate. And um, these are, well, transaction creating is, uh, the, the module for creating and sending transactions is connected automatically and they exchange information inside of the wallet to do so. And as to, you may see that we have asterisks here, they mean that these operations must be performed securely. For example, if we receive the data that does not satisfy the the protocol rules, the data is rejected. On the other hand, transaction can be created even in uh, unsafe environment since it is open anyway and it will be eventually verified. Uh, so, uh, for example, if you have this here always, even if you have this here always connected, right, but the key management is done in the cold wallet way, even if uh, someone changes your transaction, it will be verified eventually and uh and well it will be it it will be rejected by the network it's if someone tries to tamper with your transaction so it's not really uh big of a deal to uh, have this always connected and uh Yep, but once the transaction is generated, it must be signed in a secure environment. Ideally, during this step, you should recheck the amounts and recipients again. So you generate the transaction, send it to the cold storage for signing, and ideally you should check that uh, it was not modified before you signed that transaction, that, that the, uh, I don't know, address is not changed, for example, or something else is, uh, or the amount not changed or everything else is in place. And actually it was, and maybe still is a common attack uh, when the user's device is infected with a special kind of virus, which substitutes the addresses in the um, in the recipient field in many of the popular wallets, like uh, Bitcoin wallets, MetaMask, and other wallets. Uh, you copy the address, and before you paste it into the, or after, honestly, I haven't looked too deep into at which moment the substitution is happening, but when you paste the address, it is substituted by the uh, malicious, by the address of this hacker, and so whatever coins you send, if you are not paying attention to where you are sending them, if you are not double checking the address, you will send the coins to the attacker and there is nothing you can do. There is no arbitrage, there is no nothing. Uh, so you will lose the coins and you will be fooled by this threat actor. So it is important to uh, be mindful of that as well. And this is where we wrap things up for today. And let's see what questions do we have. So, um, encryption methods, uh, six keys. Uh, yep, I see it was answered for the first one. Multi-signature is not about encryption. It is about digital signature. Okay, this answer's fine. Are MetaMask, Trust Wallet, and most of non-custodial mobile wallets warm or hot? MetaMask, Trust Wallet, and all of the wallets that are that live in your browser are hot wallets because um, you are keeping the keys and you are keeping this the software on your own computer, which is always connected to the internet. So by definition, it is hot wallet. Okay. Uh, are there any more questions for today? Now is a good time to um, to voice them.
Okay, so either you all are processing, still processing the lecture or everything was crystal clear, uh, but I don't see, don't hear anything. And in this case, well, I guess we can wrap things up for today. Today was a rather quick lecture. Uh, yep, I see a question from Five Dan. Please go ahead. <clears throat> Can I ask a question about our task uh, when we implement blockchain? Uh, I think it will be best for uh, Olena to answer. Or for, uh, yeah, so please, Olena, if you can. Uh, yeah, but uh, then first of all, ask your question. Okay, thanks. Um, can you implement uh, some system where mode? which process transactions uh, isn't get any reward for it. Alena, can you please elaborate on that? Because I think you are the, uh, the, the best person uh, who would know exactly clear, um, is it possible to do uh, in our course or not? You can choose um, this case. Uh, if you want to uh, choose the, uh, another case, then we provide in our methodical um, documents as you wish, because uh, it should be interesting for you, first of all, but please, uh, pay close attention on the first stage to describe it uh, clearly in the uh, readme file. It's all of um, condition for this uh, case. Mm, okay, thanks. Alexey, what about questions? Question from Anton uh, Mishenka. Hi, I think Alexey already answered it um, about the wallet. He, he already he already gave his answer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, thanks. Okay. Thank that, you. Uh, well, maybe I'll, I'll I'll ask a follow up question. Um, can you give an example of uh, a warm wallet to just go and check it out? Um, if you know any warm wallets uh, to explore. Turn on your microphone, Alexey. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, I would say that it's best for you to explore because it would be it would it may come off as we are promoting certain uh, software or hardware, which is not uh, well. I, I would like to avoid that if possible and not to. Yeah, no uh, problem. Gotcha. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Thank you no for problem. the question yeah. anyway. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, you see that we are loyal to deep lines, so don't uh, give up and try to complete the tasks. It uh, will be interesting. And if you, if if uh, that's all uh, from Alex, we are say goodbye for next lecture. Okay, thank you, everyone. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.